Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Identity Shield 24. Um, I think this is the first session of the day. Uh, there are a couple of other tracks going on, and so thank you for showing up here um, and for the lovely introduction. Uh, a brief introduction about myself before we get started. Um, uh, somebody said I am head of AI technology, but I am not uh, an AI expert of any sorts. I just do dabble in AI, and I am looking at some AI opportunities that we can do in Mini Orange. But uh, I'm an, I am an expert, and I have been in this space and in the company for the past nine years. Uh, so as mentioned, um, you know, in the past couple of years, there has been this big shift where uh, we have now gotten into this Gen AI space. So I uh, wanted to address a topic today wherein uh, we look at Gen AI, what is doing in the cybersecurity space, how we should be careful with how we utilize Gen AI and how we can utilize it, uh, get the benefits out of it and still uh, you know, be secure with the data and uh, everything that is you know, being utilized with Gen AI. So I have a question uh, before we get you know, into the nitty gritty of things. How many of you have used ChatGPT? If you can just raise your arms. So I think it's 98% of the people here have used ChatGPT in the past you know, year or two, right? Um, so how many of you hate ChatGPT? Uh, you, know, you can just raise your arms, it's fine. Okay, zero, I see zero hands. Um, so what is it that makes it so popular? Uh, you know, it released in 2022 to publicly open to, uh, you know, being used by everybody. And in just five days, it reached, uh, you know, a million users. And that has been the fastest, you know, growth in any of, any social platform that is there out there or any B2C product that is there out there. So again, the question, what, what is it that makes it so popular? Um, so I think each one of us has, who has used ChatGPT. Uh, you might have experienced this as you sit, and you try to research something and then you know, you're Googling, uh, you go on Google and you're typing in keywords to figure out some and researching something. And you spend approximately two hours and then you come to something which is um, probably not that great. And then you go, nowadays what we do is we go to ChatGPT we type in something and then immediately in under a minute it gives you an answer, right? So it's first thing saving you time is how I see it. And uh, earlier before ChatGPT, uh, we used to say Google it and now it's more like you have a random question, you just go to ChatGPT and then type and you get an answer. So we have all experienced this, correct? Um, so there's another alternative or something which few of us might be doing is uh, do you see this regular expression? Uh, how many of you can figure out what this regular expression does? Uh, for the life of me, I cannot. So uh, what do we do in such scenarios? And some, most of us, we copy this, uh, we go to ChatGPT and we ask ChatGPT, hey, explain this to me step by step. Some of us copy paste code onto ChatGPT and say, hey, explain this code to me. And ChatGPT is smart enough, it will give you step-by-step -step instructions. It's probably not clear, but the point is ChatGPT helps you learn a few things along the way if you're not able to understand something, right? And then you can also ask them questions like, hey, ChatGPT, tell me how ChatGPT works. And it will explain it to you uh, in you know textual format and how it works. So uh, it has become a good learning tool. Some of us, uh, data analysts, might be using it to um, you know, do analysis on the data that is there out there. Um, so you can upload your data, CSV data, uh, any data, and then just ask conversationally data um, or analyze, uh, anal you know, analyze the data that is there. Um, before you would open Jupyter Notebook or you know, and code or give another command to get to new data, whereas now you can just ask, hey, compare this data to 2022 and tell me how, uh, you know, and then plot a graph and it will plot a graph for you. So uh, just to summarize, why is it so popular? Um, one, it saves you time. It has become a great learning tool. Uh, it helps you analyze data and it gives you speedy answers. Uh, so that's what 
is why, like, you, why is it so popular? Now, what are the drawbacks um, of using ChatGPT? Now, in the past few years, you might have seen many companies have started banning or you know discouraging uh, employees from using ChatGPT. Uh, in their internal, uh, you know, in their in office, or putting any sensitive information uh, on ChatGPT. Uh, the main reason is because uh, you know you put your source code there, or you put uh, you know uh, any sensitive information. If you're a data analyst, you're putting some company sensitive information there, and uh, from Apple to Spotify, everybody has you know discouraged or completely banned using. Uh, ChatGPT for any uh, office or corporate related stuff. Um, another one is it is very easy to fool ChatGPT. It gives you incorrect information and sometimes it's not sure about itself or the answers it gives out. For example, I asked uh, how many letters are there in the word 19? It said there are eight letters and uh, I asked are you sure and then it said no, you are right. Um, it's actually nine words, uh, which is not correct. Um, so another one I asked is like, hey, can you, uh, you know, how many countries begin with the letter Y? You know, can you list them out? And it gave me three of them. One was correct, two of them was not. Right. So it's, uh, we have come to, you know, many of us go to chat GPT and ask, hey, can you, can you write a code for this? We copy it, we paste it, and then now we are in a situation where you know we don't understand that code, we just copy paste it. We used to copy it from Stack Overflow and now we are copy pasting it from ChatGPT. And before we used to take a few hours, now we take multiple hours to figure out what happened with the code if it fails. Um, so, and also the data that is it is trained on is um, a little old. It is not the latest data that is being trained on, so you'll always get um, some old uh, archival data rather than the latest data that you're looking for. So incorrect information, uh, not being sure about itself, and incorrect answers are something you need to be look out for. Another drawback um, is the data that you're putting out there or the questions that you're asking. Um, like Shushma mentioned, uh, it can get leaked. You know, any, any company is uh, vulnerable to getting compromised or there can be data leaks. So it's critical to a look at like what data are you putting on ChatGPT, right? And uh, are there any breaches? So let's look at the drawbacks. Uh, the drawbacks now are the compliance aspect of it. Like companies have to deal with, okay, this is a third-party tool being used by employees, and if we are, if they are putting the data out there, how do they, um, you know, how do we make sure this is uh, working in our um, audit and compliance perspective? Uh, the data privacy, what data you're putting out there? How is that data being used? Is it actually deleted when you go and ask them to delete, you know, delete your account or delete your data? Less control over the data itself. Uh, that you're putting or that you're getting an inaccurate information. Um, so that's the summary, that's the good, that's the bad. Um, you know, it saves us time, but there are also downsides to it. So what are our, uh, you know, how do we leverage the this for our teams and for our customers, um, um, all the good parts, all the good aspects of it? Um, so the potential use cases that I see is, um, you know, you, uh, you can create searchable docs and wikis, which is somebody comes on your marketing site or someone comes on your site, and instead of having to navigate and figure out what solutions are available or, you know, going to headers, you can just conversationally ask a chatbot which is there, like, hey, I am looking for an SSO solution to SSO into so-and-so application. Could you help me out? And if, um, you know, you have a solution which can give you that answer there, then it's uh, a faster uh, answer compared to, let's say, they reach out to a support engineer and then you know they wait a couple of hours to hear back from somebody. Um, it can also be used as a learning tool, an internal learning tool. Let's say you have a model which is trained on your uh, code base. Uh, it can go in and then you know you can then ask it questions related to your code base and it will be able to give that answer, which is not completely possible with ChatGPT. You can build an internal tool for data analysis. Any data analysts here, um, you know, you can upload your data 
Uh, and you know, we saw one example where you can plot graphs and stuff and analyze on the data that is uh, that you have. Um, you can have AI-driven reporting system in your products itself. So rather than going and searching manually, you can have a system wherein the customer asks uh, who has not logged in for the past five days or who has not um, logged in for the past month and who have not set their MFA. And you can ask them conversationally and it can generate that uh, without having you to do some kind of GraphQL or others, you know, coding in the backend. Uh, and you can create low-level support bots, uh, which means anything related to licensing, pricing, um, uh, you, you know, you can create a bot which can answer those questions immediately rather than having to wait for an support engineer. So those are the potential use cases, but like we saw, there are some drawbacks to it. So how do we not compromise with security? How do we make sure that uh, this is all secure and it's, uh, you know, it gives accurate information to what you want in your organization or uh, personally? And uh, how do you make sure that you know, the data is within your perimeter and is not going out, you know, or is being misused. So uh, the main is you can just, like, the groundwork is you can just create your own private GPT and run it locally, rather than having, you know, using some external uh, provider, which is there, like chat GPT. So I, uh, let's look at some of our options, uh, and this is where we get into the code of it. Um, so this is a hands-on session. So I, there were some prerequisites. If you have not uh, installed uh, Python or uh, other tools, it's fine. You just follow along with me, and we'll uh, I'll walk you through it. And it will give you an idea in terms of what's possible uh, in terms of running your own uh, chatbot or a private GPT locally. Uh, and uh, you can go back and try it out. So there's this. So just, uh, if you want to open it, it will give you access to a code. Um, it's publicly hosted, so you can go back and try it on your own if you want to. Um, I'll just wait for a couple of seconds. You can take a photo or open it in your laptop if you have your laptops right now. And uh, we'll switch to the code. Um, okay. All right. So if we'll switch to VS Code, so Windows 2. All right, so um, I think once, if, if you're on the Bitbucket page, you can clone that repository um, so we're using git clone command, and it will give you access to this code. So what does this uh, code do? I'll just give a brief overview. There is a data folder. Uh, if you click on the data folder, um, you'll see there are some PDFs. And uh, what this PDF, um, uh, all the PDFs are all the data sheets that are there on the Miniron site already. And at least one is an OpenID RFC. Uh, then there are three files. We'll first look at each file separately. We'll look at first the test.py file. Um, so there is already a terminal open at the bottom. Uh, I'll just quickly run the code to show you uh, and then we'll walk you, I'll walk you through the code. So just have to do python3 test.py. Uh, that's the command you need to run. Um, uh, got test.py. So uh, that's the first code that we'll look at. Uh, once it runs, it will take at least like just a couple of seconds to boot up. Uh, it will give you a UI. It will, it's hosted on 127.0.0.17860. Um, Gaurav, can you go to that URL? Yeah. Go to Windows 7 and uh, just paste that. Or go to Windows 1 and just open a new tab, it's fine. All right, so you'll get this UI. This is using, well, I'll go to what libraries we are using to generate this, but the code should generate this for you. Now we can ask uh, it a mini orange related question, like what are the features that mini orange provides? And uh, if you ask that question, it will give you an output. It will take a couple of seconds. 
because and then Vinyanj offers a range of features including multi-factor authentication, adaptive authentication, so on and so forth. So um, if you can go back to the slides, uh, Windows 7, yeah. Uh, so uh, let's look at how this is working. And um, so there are two aspects to this, how um, you know the GPT is working um, on locally. Um, first, uh, we are ingesting that data. We are using something called um, one library called Llama Index. Um, and then that is being fed uh, via LangChain to a model. Uh, we are using the text embedding ADA002, which is the best embedding model which is there out there. So what is embedding? Embedding is nothing but, uh, you know, giving it uh, some text converts that into binary data, which you can then store locally. Uh, those are basically tokens um, or vectors is how we call it. And then uh, you use those vectors um, later on when you are asking it the question. So step one, when you ask a question, um, it picks up the relevant um, embeddings which were generated in the previous step here. Um, so it fetches that. Um, it then feeds that into a lang chain and sends it to your model, whichever one you're running. And then that model generates a response, and then that response is then sent to the user. So those are the two steps. Um, so the one is the ingestion, where you ingest the data, uh, which gets converted into embeddings. Embeddings are stored locally on your system, but the model will generate those embeddings for you. And the um, second step is where you ask it questions, you know, and this question uh, along with the embeddings is what generates the response which we saw. Uh, okay, so if you look at it, um, uh, you might have figured out something which is one, um, you, we are using OpenAI in the backend. Uh, the clever people here who are there. Uh, if you look at the code, we are using the OpenAI's APIs actually to do uh, the demo which we saw. So that's not exactly secure, is it? Because we are still, uh, we have gone from using ChatGPT on the browser to actually using uh, ChatGPT via an API call. Uh, this will still give you a bit of flexibility because you're doing it via code so you can audit some stuff, uh, but then it's not completely secure because the data is still going on the OpenAI's backend. So uh, let's look at our other options. What are the other two options? Um, can I go back to the code? Windows 2, all right. So there's another file which is test-hf.py. Now what we are going to do is, uh, um, we are you going to use something called Hugging Face. How many of you have heard of Hugging Face? Okay, a few people. So Hugging Face is basically an open source um, system or uh, you know a platform where people have uploaded their own AI models already. So uh, if you're interested, you can go to Hugging Face and see what all models are there out there. We are going to use one of those models here um, we are going to use something from uh, Google itself. Google has uploaded one of the models there. And we are going to run the same uh, code, uh, but this time uh, test-hf.py and see what the results are. Um, so just give it a couple of seconds to run, um, and it will run it on the same um, port. Um, and then, um, we'll see what the answers are, how is it different from OpenAI, and what can be done better. Okay, so it got started. Uh, if we go back to the browser, uh, we can do a refresh. This time, if we ask it the same question, um, what are the you know, features provided by Mini Orange? It will take a couple of seconds. and it will generate the answer for you. So that's, this time we are not using OpenAI in the backend, we are using a model which was provided, uh, that I picked it from uh, Hugging Face. Um, so let's go back to the slides, and if we look at what is happening now, so instead of using the OpenAI uh, embedding model, we are using the Hugging Face embedding model. Um, same, same steps, uh, but now we are using uh, the Hugging Face um, models, which is available there. 
Uh, one thing that is happening here, uh, if we go back to the code, is we are using something called Hugging Face Hub. So Hugging Face Hub is basically um, an alternative to um, um, chat GPT wherein all the models which we are using is actually uploaded on their servers, on the Hugging Face server itself. So they are all hosted and you can just make an API call and then use it if you want to and play around with it to understand which model is better and which is not. Uh, now you might ask a question that, hey, uh, this is still using something which is hosted by somebody else. This is not completely private. Uh, so we'll get to that. So I think the last step which is there uh, is using the something called Hugging Face Pipeline. So Hugging Face, what it has done is it has given you two alternatives. You can either use the Hugging Face Hub, uh, which hosts the code, or it can, uh, you can use Pipeline, wherein it will download that model on your system, wherever you're running it, and run the AI model on your system. For that, I'll not get into the code uh, because of the lack of time. But um, if we go back to the slide, uh, I tried running Hugging Face Pipeline, and what happened was uh, I realized that the model itself is too huge, which is like it ranged from somewhere from 10 GB to around 40 GB of um, you know download uh, files because the AI model is all LLM, so it's large language models, so they're very heavy. And then running it actually crashed, crashed my system. So if you're going to run a system, uh, if you're going to run a model on-premise, then the best alternative, uh, what I'll suggest is um, use a powerful system which has a GPU uh, or use something on AWS, a machine on AWS which, which has the relevant performance scores uh, or is AI ML optimized so that you can run, actually run the AI models. So um, to summarize um, quickly, uh, we saw the benefits and drawbacks of using um, chat GPT. We looked at how we can leverage um, you know, AI in the business. Um, we looked at how to deploy your own chat GPT solution. We looked at the models, uh, which are there. Again, the code is available if you want to go back home, you know, run it or run it here. It's completely fine. I'll suggest run the first two. And then uh, for the third one, you can try, but I think it will just crash your system if you don't have a powerful system enough. Um, then we looked at uh, the three options. Then we looked at how each solution works. Uh, we looked at, you can use the open AI, um, you know, uh, APIs via Llama Index and Langchain. Those are the two popular um, libraries. You, you know, if you're getting into AI space and you're looking at how to build an LLM-based application, those two will primarily show up. Um, and then we looked at how we can use Hugging Face uh, instead of chat GPT, a, you know, APIs which are available and uh, how to use the models which are available on Hugging Face. Um, then we looked at how, you know, running something locally, uh, like it makes sense. If you're running this locally, you have complete control over the data. You can audit stuff, you can generate reports, you can even blacklist certain keywords if you want to because you have full control over the code and how everything is, like the questions being asked, the answers being responded to, everything. Um, so I'll just quickly go over, if you can uh, exit out of this, just press escape. Um, if you go to Hugging Face, the third tab, I'll just give you a brief overview. So. Uh, this is the platform, there's this, uh, you'll need that access token. Uh, for OpenAI, using the OpenAI APIs, you'll have to have a premium account, you'll have to pay them for a, you know, API, because I think the free one does not come with enough limits to make API calls. Uh, but Hugging Face is open source and it is completely free. So the Hugging Face Hub uh, example which I showed is completely running on a free account. Um, if you can go to, um, the lang chain one, the second last. Um, so that's the library which is being used um, to create um, the private GPT which we ran, the three options. Um, so this is one of the tools and the last tab which is Llama Index. I use Llama Index because it's very, it is a good tool to ingest data and Langchain is an abstraction to help you interact with all of these open AI libraries or hugging face libraries. 
Uh, if you can go back to the slide. Um, so I think in terms of uh, the session, I think it should give you a brief overview of, um, you know, if you had to run your GPT uh, offline on your own systems, what are your options? Um, so thank you for being a lovely audience. Uh, I wanted to, you know, give enough time for any questions anybody had. Uh, and uh, those are my credentials. If you want to reach out to me, I'll be here all day. If you have any questions AI related, we also have a booth, booth one. You can come ask what Mini Orange is doing in the AI space. Uh, and thank you. If you have any feedback, you can kindly scan this and give the feedback on the session. If you have, um, you know, just rate out of five. And uh, any questions, I'm happy to answer. Like, I, there are a couple of minutes. So I wanted to dedicate it to any questions anybody might have. Uh, there is a standing mic placed on the center. So right. I would request you all to please queue up in case you have any questions. Yes, if you can uh, go there and ask, or you can shout, it's fine. Uh, anything is fine, whatever you're comfortable with. Sorry, could you be a little bit more loud? See, uh, what, I, what I saw that you were using OpenAI key. Right. So that literally not had, uh, running the code in it locally. Right. You could have used a, a different uh, LLM model, example, Falcon World TV. Right. So there were three. Uh, I'm not sure if you follow. There were three examples, right? One example was using the OpenAI. Can you go back to the code once? So the first one was using an OpenAI key, right? Correct. You got that right. Uh, the second option was using the Hugging Face Hub, where I'm not using OpenAI at all. uploaded and running on their, on the Hugging Face platform itself. Uh, the same code, if I run it, if I want to run it locally, can you go to the last one, pipeline? So just scroll down. So you will see I'm running the same one, but I'm running it a little differently with using something called pipeline. This one actually downloads the model locally and then runs it. Does that answer your question? Right. And what I have done is, if you scroll down a little bit more, there are some commented code. I have tried couple, like different AI models, which were there on the Hugging Face platform. So you can either use, try to run these, or you, uh, the one which you suggested, you can see if it's available on Hugging Face and run it. All right. Any other questions? Cool. I think uh, there are no other. Yeah, I think, yeah. Go ahead. If you can use that mic. Anybody has any questions, just come up there and queue so that we can do this quickly. Uh, so I saw. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so I saw in the code that you were using a T5 large model. Right. Have you tried it with the small or the medium size? Was it working like expected or was it just not working? Right. I, yeah, I tried with the, not with, uh, so uh, the question was the model which I was using. Can you go to the second tab? Uh, Gaurav, can I go to the second tab? Uh, the code, go to the code. Go to the second file. Uh, so he was asked that I use the Flan T5 XXL. Did I use a lower one? I think um, there is an XL version and there is also a... Yeah, I think the T5 also comes, has a small version which I have tried before for summarization. Right, right. But it does not work as... Right, so you got it. That's the answer. I did try it. I did not, I did not get the expected. So LLM is uh, basically how, how the larger the parameters are that it is trained on, the better the results will be. So um, I use the XSL one. It gave me good enough answer, but it was still not the best. So like, which, let's say I'm testing something locally. Right. Like I don't have a good enough GPU, like 2 GB right. RAM maybe, or right. VRAM. Right. So 
a medium one generally does not suffice for correct any operation like usable operation correct so what can you suggest i do for such kind like right so on your machine itself um it's difficult unless you have a good enough gpu um so like i mentioned if you have something like nvidia you know 30 series or 40 series um then you'll be able to run the ram uh, you know your llm model which you want to uh, otherwise go on aws but then yes that's the downside of running it locally otherwise use hugging face hub to experiment with whatever because the hugging face one was very simple i did not have to run anything locally but it still gave me an option to play around with the model uh, if you want some model suggestions if you can go back uh, just uh, to the presentation slide escape uh, the two ones which are the best ones is the llama model but then i think you need to be on their wait list there's a wait list for this it is available on hugging face and the other one is using uh, big signs loop bloom so this is the best one, Bloom, it's open source, it's, there's no waiting list to it. Uh, if you want, you can play around with this and uh, uh, run it on a machine uh, which uh, has enough GPU horsepower to it. And actually, while I was making this presentation, I think NVIDIA also released their own uh, you know, RTX app that you can download locally, but then I think you need uh, the 30 and the 40 series for that um, to actually run it. And I think it's 40 GB of size. So, <laughs> those are your options. All right, any other questions? I think uh, we are good, uh, done. If you have any more questions, just uh, you know, um, ask me. I'll be here all day uh, in the booth area. Just catch me, hold me, and then ask any questions you have around AI-related stuff. All right, I think we're done. Thank, thank you. you so uh, thank you for being a lovely audience. And uh, I hope you all have a lovely time here. Uh, thank you.